o'clock Eastern Standard Time and welcome back to W. Cushing and Company. Uh, this is our studio here located in Wells, Maine and I want to thank Rug Hooking Magazine and Amprey Publishing for asking me and inviting me to do this talk. We're going to talk about backgrounds today. Uh, we're going to talk about how to put a background together and if you ask questions, we are going to try and do them in real time. If not, I will answer them tonight for you. Well, first of all, everybody knows that I like a dark brown background. And my dark brown backgrounds are normally just like this. And on this rug, I only used three textures to combine. So by combining different textures, you can get a warm feel or a cool feel. What happens is I will ask you if you want a light background or a dark background. Notice I did not say a color. So by not saying a color, we're going to choose and we're going to combine. The three colors that I like the most for a dark background, which is a brown background, a warm background, is oak leaf, Wagon Wheel, and Irish Angel. These are the three that are in this rug, along with a few other browns from my scrap pile. We all have stash, we all have a little bit of scrap. So these are the three bases. And when you create a really good background, it's like a good soup. You have to start with a good stock, and then your background will flow by the colors that you like. So if brown isn't your color, and you may not like the warm background, another color, which is a dark background and leans towards a black, is this one here. Now this wool, our reversible black, is phenomenal because it's a stripe that you can cut both ways. You can cut it across or you can cut it down. And since it is reversible, you get two for the price of one. And it pairs very well with our muddy water, which has a little bit of blue in it, a little bit of brown. So if you wanted to, you could move our Irish Angel over here. Or here is some of our antique background dyed. Again, this is a stripe and you can cut it this way or you can cut it this way just to get flecks of color. The more that you add to a background, the more interest that you have. One of my favorite, favorite things to do with a background is combine all darks. This is our Southern Comfort rug. Okay. And as you can see, it's a dark background. When you look at it from a distance, a little bit from a distance, it just looks like a dark background. But when you zoom in up close, you can see we have a red brown, a brown, a blue, a burgundy, a lighter blue, a lighter brown, more blue, purple even plays in. And what you do is you cut all of your background wool that you think you're going to need and you mix it up into a basket and you pull and hook. Now I know for a lot of you mixing it up and pulling and hooking is a problem. You want to look at every one, you want to make sure that two of them aren't together, but if you want a background that has motion like this, you just pull and hook. If it looks right from here, like this, it will look right on here. Okay? Well, I know some of you are saying, well, I don't want black and I don't want brown. Okay, let's go with an eggplant or a reddish background. An eggplant or a reddish background would be these three wools. This is a great wool because you can cut it this way or this way. So a lot of you ask when we post our new woolens for sale, what does it look like hooked? This one is kind of an interesting one. 
So when you get it, you just pleat it. And as you pleat it, you see how it's hooked. And you see that it will go with this. It will go with this. And it has a little pop of purple you can put in from your stash, a little pop of fuchsia, and some black. You could even add some black to this background. So this, although a little bit more non-conventional, would be an awesome background, especially if you were going to hook your images in silhouette. If your images were going to be dark and in black, it would be a striking background. Another option, because some of us like lighter backgrounds, are these. These colors here, especially together, although they're light and dark, when you put them in and you pull and hook, you recreate an antique light background. And you, you might say, well, this jumps a little bit, this jumps a little bit less, but combined, it creates one flow. Okay? And what do I mean by an antique light background? Well, we're going to pull out an antique Burnham pattern right here. And as you can see, this, although it might be a little dirty, if you were, if you were from the 1800s, you'd be a little dirty too. But out here is a darker color with little stripes of color in it. Here's your lighter colors. Here's your lighter colors. And it's not all the same. They didn't echo. They just used what they had. This down here, okay, even a little bit of the brown, a little bit of this, doesn't even match what's on the sides, okay? The same thing with the scroll. The scrolls on either side don't match identically, which is the beauty of this. So if you're not wanting it to match exact but have the same color composition, as long as your soup mix is correct, you can create a beautiful, beautiful background similar to this with these colors. Okay? Now, sometimes we only need one wool to create a background. So we're going to move over to the welcome rug here, and we're going to look at this background. This background here, behind here, okay, these show a lot of color. It looks like we used a lot of different wools, but we didn't. We used one plaid, and we let our wool do the work. And the one plaid that we used was Ron's favorite plaid. And Ron's favorite plaid is right here. And when you look at your wool to pick for a background, let's see what the benefits are for this plaid. Well, you have stripes of color this way. You have little bits of purple, little bits of red, all different shades of green, red, orange. So when you go to cut this, if you cut it this way, you get the darker section. You get the lighter section. This makes your background just from one wool. So if you're not used to using many different colors, many different textures, this is a great wool to pick for your first dark background. And here it is when you go to scrunch it up, what it looks like. And then you can see it hooked back. Still mixed background. Now, something important to note. This is the wool before it was dyed. This is the wool after it was dyed. And all we did was rinse this in a solution of black, our W. Cushing dye black. And we mixed uh, four cups boiling water and a quarter teaspoon of black over one yard. So you, have, you could make it darker with this or lighter with this. Okay. Now this is called Honest John, and this would also work in. A lot of people overlook this wool for a background, but when you see it, you see the blue, the gold, the orange, and it would mix right in here. 
But again, a nice background. If you're doing something like a rabbit or a floral with a lot of color, this makes one background and makes a nice solid background. Okay, next. Next we have an interesting lot of colors. This is a beautiful piece. It's got tan, it's got gray, it's got black. Some people like a medium value to their backgrounds. And if you want a medium value and you're going to use darks or lights in your piece, this is a great medium value. Way, or you can cut it this way. So you can get a pebbly effect or a stripe effect. And this, it's not any magic. The same colors that are in this check are in this stripe. So the two would work very, very well together. And if you needed a lighter piece, just say you wanted to highlight an image or highlight a flower. Then we would use flax and linen, which is just a shade lighter, and these three would make a great medium value to light value background based on how much you use. If these two are the bulk of your background and this is just an accent, then you have a medium. These two can go together for a lighter background with this as an accent. Because once you have what works together, you choose how they mix, how much you want of each color. We can also do a green background. and We happen to have a lot of great greens that work together. And if you did this, this is a little bit of a blue green for a highlight and just say you wanted to do Merry Christmas in a beautiful red and in a bright red. Well, you pick your red or you pick your dyed wool, and then this would be your background because it has the red and the brown in it, and you can have a beautiful, beautiful Christmas rug with that. We can also do a red background. Not as popular. Most people don't think of red as a background, but here we have another beautiful wool. It's a stripe and it's reversible. So now you're getting the two colors, the dark and the light. And now you have your brighter red to go with it, and then you have red velvet to go on top. So these three would make a red background, and you could do your Merry Christmas in green. Or you could use this as a background and do your Merry Christmas in the reds. One other wool that we like, or one other way to make a background out of one wool, is this plain simple wool right here. It is a little loosely woven. This piece has not been washed. This is part of our $10 a yard wools. And most people overlook it until we put this stocking with it. The background for this snowman right here is this wool and it's just cut and hooked. And it creates a night sky, a snowy background, and a nice little setup for the snowman. But from, there's no other wool used in this background but this beautiful check, and you can see the white, the stronger white box plaid. Now, if you want to cut that out and make that the highlight, you can, or you can just let it fall where it's going to fall. And this is recommended, this wool, for a size six, number six cut and up. You can't go below a number six. But you can see, by the way, just pleating it together, you're getting all the wool colors into it. So by looking at your wool and cutting your wool in a particular way or just hooking, in this case, this is an echo hook. We have just echoed the snowman around and around, and then we echoed the toe. And by doing it, it created a lovely, lovely background 
for the snowman. And it made the stocking hook up rather quickly in case you need a last minute gift, which some of us normally do. Now, there is another way to do a background, which is something I just finished a rug. Um, it's called the Easy Scroll. And what I did is I took every color green I had already cut or was in my personal stash. Blue green, yellow green, check, plaid, solid, size four cut to size eight and a half cut. And I popped it into a huge basket. And when I popped it into the huge basket, I just started to hook. No rhyme, no reason. The end result is this. There's some yellow green margarita mix here. Uh, this is Christmas plaid here. Here's a gray green. Here's uh, an old, old texture called spruce. Uh, I only had a little bit. That's where it ended up. And so, as I pulled out, I hooked. And what I mean by puzzle pieces, as you can see, here's one puzzle piece. Here's another puzzle piece. And I have a pattern drawn with the puzzle pieces, and I'm going to hook them in a little bit for you to see them. Now, I know for some of you this may be hard to do, but when I ran out, I just added more greens to the mix. So this side does not match the other side, doesn't match here, and doesn't match here. I wanted the rug to look like an old rug. I was using a very bold red. I was using paisley, very, very bold. And this is snake eyes behind here. I did use one color behind here because that's also what's in the border. But I just hooked it. I would hook, I hooked, I actually started here and I hooked this piece first. I outlined it in the paisley. I filled it in with our red. And then I just started hooking. If you notice, I did not echo it. I did not do the echo, which is here. Instead, I just hooked in pieces. If I ran out in a piece, I added what was left. As long as I had a piece that was this long, I left it in the bucket. So sometimes they're that short, sometimes they're that big. But the overall effect of it is really fun, it's really different, and it really uses up what stash you have. I am going to talk for a minute uh, on some of the rugs that's behind me. A lot of you have asked questions last night. So, I'm going to start over here with uh, Thanksgiving wishes. No, these are not dyed wools. The object of Thanksgiving wishes was to use all textures in the background. So, this is the red stripe Old Glory. This is flax and linen. And this, uh, this was a blue wool that we had, and it was a plaid. So by cutting the wools in different directions, such as flax and linen, I cut some of it this way, and I cut some of it this way, and I just hooked it. Okay? These are all textures as well. The only thing that is not a texture in this turkey rug is right here, which is a piece of paisley. Okay. Let's go to Winter Buddies. Winter Buddies was done with dyed wool and yarn, but the background is just one wool, Flopsy. And by cutting it, because it has so many colors through it, and using the yellow line to highlight, it created a nice background. So sometimes, as we say, you can add up to 20, 25 wools, or just use one. And this, in this case, if we had made it too busy, it would have taken away from the simple object. Your rug or your pattern will be somewhat dictate what kind of background you use. So for here, in Winter Buddies, we used Flopsy. In 
in Thanksgiving we go, we did the combined textures of the greens again, and we moved this up. Nothing in this piece is dyed except uh, for her face, and it is all different textures combined, not just one texture. And when you take a look at it from afar, you get an overall effect of different hills, but when you look at it close, it is a combination of a lot of textures. Okay, Wendy, this one's for you since I stood in front of him yesterday. This is Here Comes Santa, and this is a combination of our dyed wools. His beard and his mustache are textured wool. How I hooked him, and also this is our reversible black using both sides of it and cutting it both ways. This is our two of our reds, vintage paisley red and garnet, and it's hooked in a larger cut. To see all the details on how we hooked it, please go to your latest uh, November-December rug hooking magazine, and all the directions on how to hook him are in there. So now we're going to see, people are going to ask, how about a gray background? Gray is in. We all like gray. We've all added gray to our home. Um, we've all had, I've had more requests for different grays than you can imagine. So when you add a gray, you have to be careful what type of a gray that you add. This has a taupey feel to it. With this line here, you have to look at your wool. So the stripes would go in a background, or you could do a real gray background, take all of this out, and use these two for a grayish background. We have enough to do a nice blue background. Here is one blue, and here's another blue. And with this blue, which is after midnight, you have your dark lines and your light lines, and this would be a highlight color. So again, midnight blue would do a lot of the work, or we could add midnight blue to our soup mix over here for one of our dark backgrounds. Next, we have a wool called Dragonfly. Dragonfly has a lot, a lot of color in it. It has a lot of different stripes. You can stripe it this way, you can do it this way, and look at all the colors, teal, purple, and orangey color. So if you wanted to use that as a highlight in a background, look what happens when you add all of this to it. You can even throw in just for fun, a little bit of grape juice. The last combination we're going to, well, we have two more combinations, but the last combination of textured wool we're going to put together are these brownie golds. Just say, you know, you say, Lisanne, I don't have a lot of stash, I don't have a lot left over, I want to make a background with a lot of motion. I like a brighter background, a lighter background. These three together, because of the way that you can cut them, and because of all the colors in each one, it will produce one beautiful background. And if you wanted to put it more towards the gold, you can add this. Or you can add this. In the case of making a background have motion, more is always better, especially if the rug is bigger. Now, you may ask, well, what about dyed wools? Where do the dyed wools come in? Well, if you pick a dyed wool that has a lot of motion where you can use one dyed wool as your background, that does work. Um, but you have to make sure that your transition in the background is not a lot. In other words, it's not too spotty, it's not too stripy. So when you cut a piece, what you're going to get 
is one overall look. So if this is a night sky or a, a darker background, a medium background, you have your glitter added in, and you would just pull and hook because it's like using three or four wools. The same thing with this piece of wool here. With this piece of wool, which is a, a nicely dyed piece, if you were to cut it and just hook it, and you had uh, bright flowers on here with golds and oranges and purples, then you could use this as your background. and let your bold motifs come off of it. If this is a little too bold for you, you go with a softer look. And this is a softer look. Again, it's washed with many different colors. So you say, well, what would I put on there? What could I use? Well, you could do something such as this. You'd have to go very bright. You could actually use dark purple. So on this background, you would go with your jewel tones. And by using your jewel tones for your flowers and for your leaves, you would create a nice background, a softer background, but pick up off the colors in a jewel tone. The next thing I'm going to talk about is, this is our giveaway, and a lot of you didn't get to see it yesterday, so we're going to lay it out. I'm not going to hold it up. I realized the light was behind me yesterday. And this is a small rose mauling bloom. Now, all you have to do is make a comment between now and Friday at 5 o'clock and you'll be entered in to win this pattern, and we will ship it out to you. Uh, Rug Hooking Magazine will be drawing the winner, and the winner will be, the announcement will be made on Monday. So with this pattern, you could go with a light background, you could go with a dark background. If you went with a dark background, of course that's what I lean to, but so we'll pick a light background. Let's pick a light background. Let's do something different. How about these colors for a background? This is a little light. It could be your border row. Or we can just do these. Okay. Or we can add from one of our other piles. And do this. And make this our border and this our background. So if we did this for our background, which is a beautiful neutral background, what would we add in for the flowers? Well, with the flowers you can go in a number of different directions with dyed wool and or textured. Here's your stems, here's some flowers, uh, here's even a deeper flower, even yellow topaz will go with that. So if your background is calm, you can really pop your colors. Now you may say, well, I like to combine some textured wool in this. Well, you can do that as well. We can come over and this would stand up to it. We could use some grape juice in here. a flower and if you did one of the flowers this way or two reds you could use the purple grape juice and possibly another dyed piece to go in. So this whole pile here would make an awesome rug. But the background is the most important thing if we don't pick the background, we get stuck on what we're going to put on top of it. So, we've picked our background. We've picked some of our flowers. You've decided that you want a deeper green for the leaves or two tones. You don't want it to be too monochromatic. 
and now it's starting to look like a Christmas rug. We'll have to change it up a little bit. But if we did this, and then we decided we were going to add in a little bit of this, and maybe a little bit of this. So what do we do once we get done? Do we put our flowers in, then echo our flowers to the border? Because we don't hook in straight lines in this. You can, or you can do something that is called puzzle pieces. It's not S's, it's not C's, but it's actually puzzle pieces. So, I am dressed, I have my Sharpie. So, what we do, and I've done it with this rug here in progress, and this rug has many different pieces to it. You can see the birds are hidden. I am not really echoing the birds, but I've drawn in these puzzle pieces. They're right here. And I'm going to draw in another one right here, and another one right here. So when I go to hook in my puzzle pieces, what I do, as you can see, I've started this puzzle piece, and what I do is I'll outline my puzzle piece. And when I outline my puzzle piece, I set the parameters. I'm not going to vary from what I've drawn. I've put the puzzle pieces at different sizes. Notice this is big, this is small. But when you look at it, they all lay in together. And by doing that, and I may use the same wool, I may not use the same wool. It depends upon what my mix is, it depends upon what I'm pulling. And once I'm done, I'm going to fill it in. So here is my mix. That's my bird, so we'll pull him out. But here's my mix for this puzzle piece. So now all I'm going to do is fill it in, just like this. Now some of you will ask, my goodness, she hooks rather quickly, how does she do that? If you notice, I'm not counting spaces. What I'm doing is I'm sliding down my last loop and I'm pulling it up and over. When I do that, I'm setting my distance this way, and I'm pulling up and over this way. So by sliding down my last loop and pulling up and over, I'm doing two things with one motion. And by doing the two things with the one motion, I set distance and height. Now why don't I count? Because I may be using different sizes, different cuts of wool in the same background, also different weights of wool. So you see I'm sliding down, I'm pulling over. My fingers underneath are right next to my linen. If you drop your hands too much, you will twist your noodle. And this I call these noodles because our cutters look like pasta makers. So this is the noodle. But if you drop your hand too far from your linen, that's when you get twisted noodles. And so by doing this, you avoid packing, which we won't mention who's packers in the group that's listening. You know who you are. And so you won't pack your wool. You'll evenly space it based on the weight of the wool. And when I learned how to rug hook in 1976, we were not allowed to turn our frame. We did not have a frame that turned. So we had to turn, we had to learn to hook in every direction. Now I understand you can turn your frame as much as you would like, but you don't have to. So now that I'm coming back around and I'm echoing the puzzle piece shape, you can start to see how using the different colors has filled in nicely. And here we are. We're almost done. 
And I'm not worried when I run out of this noodle, I'll just pick up one in the pile. I'm not going to look to make sure I don't have two in a row. I'm not going to make sure that where I ended is where I begin the next one because it really doesn't matter as long as your colors are good from the beginning. And if they're good from the beginning, they'll make a wonderful background. They want to know what hook you're using. I am using a Hartman bent hook. This is um, a Hartman that's made for us in Ireland. This is the space with your thumb. And it's a bent hook. When I learned in 76, I learned on a bent hook. So, I am pushing it down. And the advantage to a bent hook is, I'm not fishing. I pull it down and I pull it up. Any other questions that came up? Just a few. Okay. <clears throat> Want to read me some of the questions, if you can? Um, I don't know if I can scroll up. Oh, that's okay. Uh, but I do know um, some people wanted to know the names of those golden. Oh, sure. We'll go there. back. We'll go back, and we'll make sure that we get you the names of the golden wools. Another one is, is the sparkle. Is it okay to iron? The the sparkle is okay to iron. That's a very good question. Whoever asked that question. Um, the the um, the reason is. It is woven into the warp, not the weft. You can iron this and you can steam it because I've dyed this and we've put this at a almost a boil or a, a simmer for 20 minutes and it does not melt. Also, it is not as um, loosely woven, so it will not hurt your cutter either. That's a great question. So, our puzzle piece is done. This is our background. When we get ready to go to the next puzzle piece, we just start right over here. Just like this. Now this is a six millimeter, and I should have said that, I apologize. This is a six millimeter bent hook. Um, I like a six millimeter. Uh, that's my preference. It's lighter weight in your hands. And if I was hooking with a four cut, I would only go to here. I don't have to go all the way down. With the graduation of your shaft, you can use this hook for different sizes. You don't have to change your hook based on what you're hooking with. Any other questions? Is it hard to switch from a straight hook to a bent hook? No, it is not. Um, to switch from a straight hook to a bent hook, if you... If you're using a pencil hook, yes it is, uh, because you hold your hook differently. But if you're using a straight Hartman, a bent Hartman will take the pressure off your wrist. Just this week, we had a woman in our Tuesday class who just had rotor, uh, rotator cuff surgery, and her straight hook was bothering her. And so we switched her to a bent hook, and in about 15, 20 minutes, her shoulder stopped hurting. So it puts less pressure on your joints. I hope that answers that question. Another question, Amanda, if there is one? Um, there was one about the names of these uh, textures over okay, here. Okay, go ahead and highlight the textures and I'll say the names. Um, this is a Golden Seed. I don't know if this is on our Etsy or our website, but we'll double check it. This is Gold Rush. This is one of my most favorite uh, plaids that there is because you have brown, tan, gold, and orange. It, you actually get a lot, lot of um, use out of this. This is a new texture. This is pear wood. I mean, I'm sorry, this is hot toddy. This is hot toddy. And this is wasabi. So um, hot toddy works really, really well with wasabi and, and the gold rush, or vintage gold. It's one of the two. And what was the name of this uh, rug on the floor? The rug on the floor is um, Easy Scroll. And this is a hall, a Ruth Hall pattern, which is really a Ralph Burnham pattern. And that is called Easy Scroll. And it is an easy scroll if you think about it because there's only three colors, red, 
gold, and green. And it works really well with three colors. If you like dark blues, you could do this in blues and in golds and in reds. You could do it in red, white, and blue. You could do it in shades of gray. There's a lot of different things that you could do color combination with this rug. Um, and this rug hasn't been steamed yet, and we'll bind it. Hopefully the next podcast that we do, I'll go over how I bind with wool, if, if you would think that would be interesting, because I cannot whip, but I do bind with wool, as you can see. Another question is, what was the name of the giveaway rug? The name of the giveaway rug, it's by Samya Donji, and it's Small Rose Mauling. And why it's called Small Rose Mauling is because the original pattern is 82 inches long. And I know everybody just gasped. But this is Small Rose Mauling Blue, and it's 26 by 50. And it will accommodate any size cut. But it's called small because the original version is 80 inches long. It is a haul runner. questions? Um, no, not really coming in at the moment. Okay. Send well, your questions, girls. Yep. So let's come on back and let's look at how our two puzzle pieces have come together. He can't, can't see him. He can't see him. Oh. So we did have somebody else looking at the questions, but it's not coming in on that computer. So Amanda will read me the questions. So here's our puzzle pieces coming together. If you notice, you can't really tell that they're two different pieces. Can you show the background again with the hooked puzzle? Yep, this is the hooked puzzle. And now do you want to go to a background that I've already hooked with the hook puzzle? Or do you want to see this? Here this is. And here is the background. Here's that first puzzle piece that I hooked. And then here is the second puzzle piece that I'm putting in right now. And if you can't tell where one ends and one begins, that's the idea of the puzzle piece. You get overall motion, but you can't see where one begins and one ends. Do you worry about the values? No, I do not. I do worry about the values when I pick the original background. I don't stray too much from the original values. But sometimes we need a little highlight to go around an image, or we may want to feature a flower, or make the basket appear illuminated. So I may pick um, a, a value that is a, a tad lighter than I normally would. But normally, no, I don't worry about it, because if it looks good in the pile together, it will look good in the background. Someone would like to know what frame you're using. I am using a Snapdragon. I prefer my Snapdragon frame. Um, I like a Snapdragon frame and I have it on a uh, on a stand so I can adjust it and um, I don't know if you've ever seen Snapdragon so I will take it off for a minute so that you can see it. Here is the Snapdragon frame. And then you lay your frame and you lay your pattern on the frame. It doesn't eat your arms. It is protected. Um, it is my frame of choice for smaller projects. And there's paddles. And as I tighten each paddle, you can hear it tighten. You can see it tighten and it opens up the holes. So if I'm working in a smaller cut or if I'm working on something extremely detailed, the holes are open. And with the holes being open, then you can go in and you can see where you're hooking. So now is I'm... Is this called Higgly Piggly style? It's, it is a Higgly Piggly. I prefer to call it puzzle pieces. Um, because with puzzle pieces, I do want you to make sure that they lock together. Higgly Piggly is more into, I knew somebody was going to ask it, so I hooked some last night. This is more Higgly Piggly. 
I've just done little things, I've done straight lines, and it's more linear or echoing in many different colors. Um, but yes, this can be called Higgly Piggly as well. Somebody would like to know the, the name of the deer pattern. The deer pattern is called Winter Buddies. It is based on the artwork of Cindy Lindgren. And this has been hooked in a lot of different colors. Um, some people like a brown deer with a light background. Uh, this can be a cardinal or a chickadee. Uh, this happens, and I know somebody's going to ask what wool this is. This is our gull, G-U-L-L, dyed wool. And right now, I think a fun way to hook this is to hook this in a Christmas plaid, keep the antlers white, and do a dark background. I think that would be something different to use a red and green Christmas plaid and hook it in maybe a dark blue background or something like that. So it would be um, very, very nice. And this can be made into a wall hanging or a pillow. I hope that answered that question for you. It did. Back to the frame. Yes. They would like to know the difference between a high boy and a low. Sure. Okay. A high boy, what I have here is a high boy. A high boy is here. It is not angled. This is a flat top. I don't have an angle to it. An angle would have a high and a low. The low boy is about this high. You lose about two, two and a half inches. And I like to have um, some, I like to be able to move underneath it. I like to, so my hand doesn't bang any of it. So I really, really like a high boy. And this is a flat top, not an angled high boy. Uh, somebody else wanted to know, do you pick your patterns, I mean your background first? Yes. I always pick my backgrounds first. I learned that lesson back in the year 1999. And hold on for one minute and I'll tell you why. Bear with me a minute. And here I come again. This is the pattern why I always pick my backgrounds first. You see, we all make mistakes and we have to learn from our mistakes. This is called Patriotic Parade. And I hooked everything, including the border, before I picked my background. Big mistake, because I have a black crow, I have white, I have yellow. So this rug sat for four months. And one day I was riding home from work and thought of Purple Mountain's Majesty, patriotic, and I put a purple background in with little highlights for fireworks and called it a day. But I had to go back and outline my crow, outline here. So since that day, I picked my backgrounds first. Someone would like to know if you have a rug, a finished rug with the S curves in the background, so to compare it to the puzzle pieces. Sure. Let's go. We're going to put them on the floor so you can see them better. This has a has S curves out towards the fern. Your S curves come down here and around the fern. I did that to add interest to the background. I didn't hook this in puzzle pieces per se. I did a lot of little S curves in there um, more so than I, than I would normally. As opposed to puzzle pieces. So the S curves will draw your eye out. They'll extend your rug where puzzle pieces give you an overall look. And now I'm going to put this on top. 
because this is a dark background like I did the S curves, but done in puzzle pieces. So the double cornucopia is in S curves, and Southern Comfort is done in puzzle pieces. They're saying it's beautiful. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. We're going to pull out one more antique rug that I haven't pulled out yet. And I'm going to show you um, what we all try to do. This is an antique rug. This is also a burnum. And if you notice, it is done in puzzle pieces. And I know we all love these colors, and I am going to turn it over in a little bit. But if we look at this, look at the puzzle pieces. Look at the puzzle pieces. Here's some more pieces. And really, it was a bunch of different wools. These little scrolls down here. Don't match these little scrolls down here. She either started with this or ended with this. It doesn't appear in the others. But it's an overall look. And in order to see the puzzle pieces even better, that's what it originally looked like before it faded. And I know we all try and achieve the faded look, but this is what it looked like. And you can see the pieces are a little bigger than what I drew, what I used on this piece, but they are done in puzzle pieces. I have a question of what is the red on the scrolls? The red on the scrolls uh, is our garnet. Uh, it is our garnet dye and a little bit of vintage paisley. And these are the two colors in the scrolls. Our garnet is done, is dyed in what we call a tourmaline fashion because we call it faceted. And then I ran out, I was in the car, we were getting ready to go someplace, and I threw some vintage paisley in. So some of the lighter pieces of the scroll where I ran out of this, I use this. Some people are asking about washing the wools. Uh, our wool, if it's dyed, you don't need to wash it. Our textures, except for our $10 a yard textures, are washed once very lightly. Uh, these rugs are milled for rug hooking or for making uh, garments. So you can wash them until they're full to, to what you would like, uh, but we do wash them once. The idea of washing them many times came from when we used clothing and you had to take the sizing and the dry cleaning out. So everything you see here has been washed. Any other questions? Another question is how do you know how big a puzzle piece to make? I base it on how much background I have. I am a little lazy, so um, if I have a lot of background to do, I would do a puzzle piece this big from here to here. This runner, I can't do it as big, so my puzzle pieces are smaller. Whether they're big or whether they're small, as long as your backgrounds all blend, it won't matter. What you don't want your background to do is detract from your motif. You don't want your background to draw your, back, your eye to one part of the background. You want it there, you want it to have motion, but you want your motif, floral, animal, whatever you're hooking, to pop off of it. Another question is what size cuts do you normally use? My favorite size cut is an eight or an eight and a half. Uh, I have been hooking with a lot of sixes lately. And um, I mainly like an eight and eight and a half, but I do hook with a three and a four as well. When I learned how to hook in 1976, uh, we hooked, uh, number five was a large cut. 
so I do hook with two threes and fours. Uh, what you see back there, the blue of dusk, and the uh, the barns and the church, they're all done. Christmas in the Valley is done in two threes and fours. Can you mix sizes? Oh, yes, definitely. That adds to the dimension. Uh, in the Easy Scroll, I have everything from a size four cut to an eight and a half. And when they're put in the mix, you really can't tell. I don't normally stick with one cut per rug. That was a great question. Another one is, are medium value tones a no-no for backgrounds? No. No, it's not. It depends upon if you want to do a really bold motif or if you want to do a more subtle, more neutral motif. Medium value backgrounds are harder to pick colors for, but it doesn't mean that you can't use them. It just makes it a little harder to color plan the whole rug. Do you recommend background cuts usually the same size as the foreground? Yes, I do. Don't don't let your you know, you can go up. If your if your flowers or your scrolls are in a size six, you could go up to a seven or an eight, but don't jump to a nine for the background. Uh, the same thing as if your motifs are in a five, you can go to a six or seven or keep it in a five. Another question is, do you use alternative materials in yes, any of your rugs? I use, uh, I'm pretty much a purist, but I do like to use paisley. I love vintage paisley. I try and put it in a lot of my rugs. Um, we could do a whole two hours just on paisley. Uh, Santa? I, Santa has a lot of different things in the rug, and I'll point them out to you. This is burly spun. This is our burly spun yarn. Uh, I liked it because it looked like fur. This is Angora yarn um, that I knit my first sweater in eighth grade and I had two skeins left over and I used it here and I used it here. And if you knit, if you hook this with, an, with Angora, afterwards I took a little, a little uh, brush and I just brushed it to make it fuzzy. And I brushed her sweater to make it fuzzy as well. This is Paisley. This is um, suede yarn, Lion Brand suede yarn. And then up in here, the teddy bear is mohair. Uh, he is sculpted, but I had two strands that I dyed of brown mohair and then a lighter color. And I hooked the teddy bear with the two strands of mohair. This is the nod to the uh, British Mohair Teddy Bear Society. They use our dyes to dye all their mohair for their teddy bears, including the royal teddy bear. So that's what I think the teddy bears should look like for the royal family. So that's why I did that. Pardon me? Okay. So up here, this is just sculpted. This is wool. This is sculpted. And then we did yarn again. Now, one of my favorite new things to use, we'll go over here, is this is Arctic Rays. This is needlepoint thread. And it's applied after you steam it and after you hook it to look like snow. It adds a little bit of glitter, a little bit of highlight. Hopefully you can see it. And we have it in all different colors, but I really like to add that because you can place it where it goes. It looks just like icicles. It does look like icicles. And I also put a little bit in Santa up in the cheek and stuff to give him a little bit of glitter too. So yes, I do use some alternative materials as well. We are approaching three o'clock. If there are any more questions. What is sculpting? Sculpting is um, a cheater's way of Walderboro. You hook things real high and then you sculpt them. You cut them and you sculpt them into like the bell, the mustache, the eyebrows. They would like to know what you mounted Santa on. I did not mount Santa. I did not mount Santa on a dummy board. Uh, I was asked by Deb Smith of Rogue Hooking Magazine, uh, because it is the 30th anniversary of the magazine, to hook, uh, this is Joan Moshimer's pattern, but to hook it my style. So he is not mounted. 
he has a rolled edge and he is finished with wool. And all I'm going to say is thank you, Jane Dunaway. I got another question about what is the plaid that was in the welcome rug here? This is called Ron's favorite plaid. And Ron's favorite plaid is named because it is my husband's favorite plaid. Here it is. And here it is. There you go. They also want to know when you'll be back again. I don't know when I'll be back again. I'll work that out with Rug Hooking Magazine. Hopefully I'll be back in a few weeks and we can talk about finishing rugs or whatever you would like. Send in your recommendations. If I don't see you, which uh, I know a lot of people out there I haven't seen in a while. So, hello, welcome, good to see you, um, and I won't, see, I won't see many of you before Thanksgiving, so I wish all of you a happy Thanksgiving, safe travels, and a wonderful holiday season. And I also want to thank one more time Rogue Hooking Magazine and Ampry Publishing for this opportunity. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye.